OK, that's recording started, so good morning, everyone. Um, a quick reminder for those that don't know. Um, there are simultaneous uh, transcriptions. So you can choose to. See what I'm saying. So if you go to the three dots menu on Teams, you can turn on live captions. And the other nice thing about that is it will also do live translation as well as transcription. So I think there's about 20 languages that it will do live translation for. So if English isn't your first language, turn on the transcriptions. If it supports your first language, then that might help in terms of trying to understand me. But of course, if you don't, just stop me. So as I said, my name's Tony Gurney. I'll be a lecturer for this module. Um, what I'm going to do today is take you through what the module is about, what we'll be doing. Importantly, I know for you guys how it will be assessed. And uh, I'll give you the chance to, to chat about any of that that you need to know. I want to know more about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as usual, and as you saw in the video, put your hand up or put something in the chat. Or there's only, you know, there's only 20 of us or so. Unmute. In fact, turn on your video. Let's pretend that we're all together the way we used to be instead of being stuck facing a computer remotely as we have been for the last couple of years. So if you're up for it, turn on your camera and um, we can see each other as well as talk to each other. No camera for me this week. Uh, my HDMI capture cards died. Yay. Oh dear. No streaming for you either then. You know, one built in. You're the, you're the only person in... Oh, there's Logan. Hey, Logan. James is the only person in the world without a built-in camera in his computer. Oh, and there's Luke as well. And Harry, my goodness. Oh, ah, you're all turning on your cameras. This is good. It actually feels as if we're all together. This is nice. Oh, Sean's recovering from COVID. Oh, dear. Oh, that's famous. Hi, famous. Famous looks as if he's hiding in the corner, scared that somebody will see him. <laughs> OK, so as we're going through, as usual, um, don't hesitate to stop. <laughs> Natalie's still on her PJs. Well, if it makes you feel any better, my daughter did her last 18 months of her degree in her pyjamas, or her onesie, too, I think it was. And I've just remembered that I'm recording this and it's going to be on YouTube, so don't anybody tell her, because she'll kill me if I tell if she knows that I told everybody that. OK, so let's get started. Um, I will talk a wee bit about what business systems analysis is. Um, and as usual, we'll try and take some breaks and see how we get on. I'm sure you would get on well with her, Natalie. Everybody gets on well with her. OK, there we go. So, I suppose the first question that you have when we're doing business systems analysis is, what exactly is a business analyst? Um, the issue that we have is that there are a bunch of users who who know about the business and know everything about the business. And we have a bunch of systems analysts and programmers who know about computers and programming and all that kind of stuff. But the computer people didn't know about the business side. And the business people didn't know about the computing side. And so when they were talking to each other about these things, they would have an issue 
communicating. Because the business people would say things like, so our accounts receivable process starts on the penultimate day of the month. And the computing guy sitting there going, your accounts what now? Conversely, the computing person will be sitting there going, so what we need to do in order to optimise the data store is to convert this to a SQL database. And if you like, we can use uh, an interactive web-based interface to give everyone access to that. And the business people just sit there and go, huh? So that link was always an issue. It wasn't quite there because people didn't really understand. And this had been going on for a long time and I'm as guilty of it as anyone else I can remember. Um, I, I used to have a, a company that sold software. And we had a, a commission from a really large multinational company because they'd seen our software with another client and wanted their own version. Absolutely, signed the contract, let's go. Um, but in the meantime, what I'd done was found some nice new libraries. Now, this was back in the days when it was um, text interfaces. You know, if you did introduction to programming with text-based menus, that's, that's what we're thinking now. And once I had this contract for this new system, and having found these new libraries, it gave me a, a lovely new user interface. I was, of course, desperate to use them. So when I was creating this new system, I used these new libraries and I was really happy with it because I thought it looked great. And I traveled down to, I don't know, just outside of London somewhere. It starts with an S. And then we'll come to Londonshire somewhere to demo this new system. And there was me. There was the guy who'd ordered the system and his tech guy just to make sure that it would all work with their systems. And I'm busy demoing the system and his tech guys, well, he's really happy about it as well. But the guy who'd actually ordered the system was really, really confused. Really not happy. And I couldn't understand what was going on. Until he explained to me, well, this wasn't the system I ordered. I wanted something really system where if I wanted function one to happen, I press the number one. I didn't want to use arrow keys and then press enter. I just want to press the number one. And my initial reaction to my shame was one of, oh, what do you know? But of course, he was absolutely right. It was his system. He knew what his people wanted, he knew what they needed to do, and he knew the best way for that to happen. So eventually what I had to do was undo six weeks worth of work, take out this new interface and go back to the previous one, because of course it was their system and they were right. So we had this disconnect. They wanted a system for their business, I wanted to play with new toys. Let's not let's not beat around the bush. So we had that disconnect. So the business analyst would have been helpful in that case because we had the business person who was talking about what they wanted to do and we had me who early in my career was just all about the programming and all about what that could do. And we didn't talk in the same way. I was fluent in the computing side, but I didn't understand their business that well. Because stupidly, I hadn't made the effort to understand their business. That, of course, was a big problem. It was a problem for me. It cost me, as I say, six weeks work. It may have had other costs, intangible costs, because that guy no doubt spoke to some of his colleagues. If it had gone well, New contracts all round, lots of money all round. But I'm assuming his feedback was, yeah, they came in with this new thing that they hadn't even spoke to us about. So the business people with the money 
were unhappy with what the computing people were doing, and the computing people were unhappy with the business people because it was really difficult to explain what was going on. So we needed somebody in the middle, and that's where the business analyst came in. Oh, James has got his camera going. So that's where you're going to come in. Because clearly you're doing a computing degree. So you know about the computing side. Some, but not all of you are doing business technology degrees. So the assumption is you're interested in how that will work with business. And that's what this module is set up to do. Set up to understand how you can work as that liaison between the people who have the money, the people in the business who understand who's involved. The word used is stakeholders, but I see it so often it just makes me cringe every time I read it or say it. Who understand how the business works, who understand the policies, who understand the legalities, all that kind of stuff. We need someone who can take that on board, but be mindful about how that can be implemented on the computing side so that the business can achieve its goals. So that's what business analysts do. And that's what business systems analysis, the module, will hopefully help you become. Because we have an issue that's only getting worse. Systems are more complex, as you well know. I was just describing a, a system that used one, two, three, and someone who wasn't happy that I changed it to one where you use the arrow keys to choose the menu and then enter to select. How do you think people who haven't seen a system before now react when a Windows machine is thrown at them and they don't know which icons of which, what to press when, which function is triggered by which option and how that fits into what they do in their day to day business. Part of that is because computing itself has changed. Computing in the early years was so expensive that it was incredibly specialised. If you wanted a, a machine, you paid tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds for it, sometimes even millions of pounds. Sometimes you had to dedicate a whole room or a whole floor to this magic machine with specialised air conditioning ducts and people who in white coats who knew how to tend to it. And that was great if what you were doing was lots and lots of tedious adding up, you know, the sorts of things that banks would do. So whereas before they would have computers, oh, by the way, and I mean computers in its original sense of the word, because computers were people sitting at desks in rows adding up numbers. That was the original computers. The name computers for the electronic version only came in later and they were called electronic computers and it was only later that the electronic was dropped. The point is, if you were a bank, you could invest tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of pounds, both in the hardware and in the people to tend it because it got rid of hundreds of people who would add up and the computer would add up much uh, more reliably and much faster. So the banks who could afford those didn't mind doing that because it saved them a fortune and they got more reliable output. So that was the original way that computers worked their way into businesses. We have this tool, it has this function, how do we integrate it? Now, we're coming at it from the other way because computers can do so many things, because they have so many functions, because the options are tending towards the limitless. It's not we have a computer, how do we integrate it into the business? And by the way, this computer is so 
expensive that the business can change if it comes to it. Now it's the other way around. Now it's we have the business and it works and computers are cheap. How do we make computers serve the business? And part of that is because of this early work with computers where they were so expensive, where you had to hire people who knew just about the, the computers to tend to them. IT got the reputation unfairly that it was just a, a drain on the business, an overhead, not something that was an asset for the business. So IT, in the same way as every other aspect of the business, now has to fight for its funding. So that's where business systems analysts come in. You're the kind of people that can talk to users. So this is starting at the bottom and working up. You'll be able to talk to users, figure out what they are doing and understand what they need to do so that you can produce a specification. Now, importantly, that specification works both ways. It works for the business to understand, so it has to be written in a way that the business can understand what's going to happen. But it's also a computing specification. So you can write it for the business to say, this will allow us to store all of our client uh, data and uh, all of their transactions will also be cross-referenced and able to be found within a, a millisecond. So that's the business spec. And then the spec that you give to the computing side is we're going to need a uh, a multi-aspect relational database with um, the ability to host at least 40 clients with simultaneous access to that. In other words, if you want to start a call center, those are the two different types of spec that you have. The other thing you'll then do is start thinking about how those have worked. So once you've specified what the system is, you might want to test it and check that it works in terms of the business requirements. And if it doesn't, you might need to say what needs to change. So you'll simultaneously be checking it for the business, saying to the software side, this, these are the changes that are required, but also for the business side, supporting them and saying, well, this is a new system coming in. This is how you use it. So there's this pull from both sides again. And then as you progress in your career, you'll start writing business cases where you'll talk about what could be done and how much it will cost and what the impact on the business will be. And then you'll manage the whole project as well. Now, this isn't just something that I've made up. It is a thing. Now, rather, oops, rather stupidly, I didn't actually check this before coming on this morning. So this is live. I have just clicked on that. I was wondering why it's taken so long. My default browser's Chrome and Chrome wasn't on. So it's just starting up Chrome. So it's a wee bit slow because my computer's a wee bit slow. I might be quicker to copy and paste in the URL and put it onto. Firefox when it's already there. I shall do that. This is how Firefox is already running. 
and just grab another tab on Firefox. And I don't need to. Chrome has indeed popped up eventually. So let me just grab that Chrome tab and show you what it's done. OK, so. We have. Now remember, this was just a search for business systems analysts in Glasgow. Business analyst, 38 to 40 a year. Help clients solve knotty problems. Use creativity. Business in instincts to deliver world class software. So you have to know the solutions. You have to know what's out there to help the business. You have to create requirements. All the technical ones, including the UML and the BPMN, all that kind of stuff. You have to plan and steer meetings, workshops and training sessions, conduct testing, get feedback, iterative improvements. I couldn't have planned this better. This is everything that I've just said in my presentation is everything that's the the job spec here. A more entry level one. Doing a, a business systems implementation to implement SAP, which is a, a big a big accounting and customer relationship management company. Barclays are looking for them. East Ayrshire Council are looking for them. Morgan Stanley. University of Strathclyde. I don't think University of Strathclyde is actually a thing, is it? I think this must be some kind of, I think it's just be a false ad. I don't think you. I find it hard to imagine that there's any other university other than the University of Western Scotland. So we'll, we'll go across that one. Barclays, Ofgem, JP Morgan. Oh, look, we need one. Who knew? Maybe I could get a new job. You get the point? I didn't set this up. I just did a quick search and you've got the the slides so you can do the same search as well. So it's on the slide, feel free to have a look. <laughs> yep, no bother, Harry. So it is it is a thing and it's quite a big thing. And that's part of the reason I was asking you why you chose it earlier, because I was wondering if some of you had actually looked this up and thought, you know, actually, this might be pretty good for my career. And it is a career, so you've got uh, an actual career path here. So you'll start as an entry level You'll work your way through. And you'll see some some titles there, some sample titles of jobs you might have senior analyst, business or enterprise architect, director, vice president, that kind of stuff. So you can, it is a career, it is a it is a good career, and it's a useful thing to get into. It's not going to go anywhere. This tension between computing and business isn't going to go anywhere. You'll always need those people in the middle who can do both. But it's not easy, and I'm not going to pretend that it is easy. And it takes time to gain knowledge, 
gain skills, gain experience in order to do this well. That's why the career path is a career path. It's not just, oh, I have been there for two years, therefore I get a promotion. It's what skills have I learned? What experience have I got? What can I show in terms of my approach to a new project? In other words, it's a continual thing. And you can see there from that slide how that might progress. You start off the way you'll be starting off in this module. So I'll be giving you lots of techniques and you'll be using them, but you won't have an awful lot of judgment about them because you don't have anything to compare them against. But as you continue to work at it, you start to get better understanding. You start to understand the context that you're working in, that, that a solution for one business might not be suitable for another business, depending on what they're doing. So you will get better, but not everyone gets better at the same rate and not everyone continues to get better. So everyone will start off as a novice, but not everybody will reach that expert stage. That's down to you and how much effort you put in. And this is a thing not just for business systems analysts, this is just a thing. Because you always start off, think back to two, three years ago when you started in computing and you came in and, and didn't have much of an idea of what was going on. You just basically had to do what you were told. And you didn't make any judgments. But as you progressed, you started understanding what was going on. You started seeing it in in context. But you couldn't quite yet decide, well, I need to put in, you know, 60% of my time on this program and 40% on the documentation because you, you didn't have the experience to understand that. So you just do everything exactly the same. It was all exactly the same all the time. Now you're starting to get to the competence stage where you are seeing lots of things happening. You understand that there's lots of things happening and you can see how those relate to what you're trying to get to. So just in the, in the context of your degree, you're now starting to see you know, similar types of assessment pop up. So if somebody says, oh, we are going to do this, you go, oh yeah, been there, done that. I need to approach this this way. If it's a report, I probably shouldn't leave it till the night before to try and write a 20,000 word report. So you start understanding that what you do has an outcome in your goal. So you start to plan and actually once you start planning that, that then becomes a routine. You don't plan it so much because you've done it. You have experience and you don't need to write it down as much. So you become more proficient. You start seeing the whole situation and you can decide which bits are more or less important. More than that, you can start seeing things that don't quite fit. You know, all those hokey TV detective dramas. Where they always go, ah, it was just too easy. Or, oh, yeah, well, they've never done that before. Maybe it's a different killer. Duh, duh, duh. You start to see the same sort of thing. In all areas, you start to see differences because there are so many things that work the same way, you start seeing the exceptions. So eventually you end up as an expert. You know what to do, so if you don't do what's expected, it's not because you don't know how to do it, it's because you've decided that there's a better way to do it and you have the skills and experience to do that. So just as an example, does anyone recognise these two uh, artists here? Either come on Mike or put something in the Picasso says Harry, which one left or right? They're not both Picasso, but at different stages of his life. 
Because he exactly. started off doing like really good art, and then he went do lally with whatever happened. Well, good's a subjective term, so I wouldn't use that. But the point I'm trying to make with this is you're quite right. They are both Picasso. And actually, many of you will have recognised the right hand side one as a Picasso, because that's exactly what you think of as a Picasso. And often people go, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not very good, as Harry would have it. Why isn't he a proper painter? But and proper very much in inverted, inverted commas. I mean, of course, subject the to the subject of the viewer, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, I would think part of the part of the issue is that um, on the left, he is following the rules, but by the time we get to the right, he knows what rules to break, and other artists can tell what rules he's breaking. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Rules of perspective, rules of viewpoints, rules of color. And of course, he can break them. He's not coming to this with no knowledge. Some people look at the right hand side one and think ah, it's just a kid playing about. No, it's not. Because they can do the stuff on the left hand side. Quite happily, quite easily. But he's decided that's not what he wants to do. He wants to approach it in a different way. The point I'm trying to make is. You can't do the right hand side stuff until you learn to do the left hand side stuff. In other words, you have to learn all the rules, all the techniques. You have to get all your skill together. Before you can end up with something in the right hand side. And that's the same in your career. Yes, break the rules, but as long as you understand what the rules are in the first place. So that's the idea with this model, the idea that you work your way through and that you learn things, that you get better continually. I, of course, am a great artist, but I choose to create things that look like this, that only look as if I don't know how to draw, but I choose to do them that way. The problem with having asked you to turn on your cameras is I can see you're all laughing at me. That's just unfair. And, and, and frankly, a wee bit hurtful. With you, not at you, because I, I too am a great artist and <laughs> I too know the struggle. The reason for this graph is because you are trying to get better. But as you get better, what tends to happen is you do get better and you feel as if you're getting better. But then you start to think, oh, James, there's so much I don't know. And your confidence goes. So you actually think you're getting worse. Anybody who's ever played any sport or played an instrument or anything like that will understand this feeling. You start off not being able to do it. And then, you know, you hit a golf ball 100 yards and you think, fantastic, I'm getting better. And then you go out the next time and you can't hit the golf ball at all. And you think, oh, no, I've got worse again. Or you start off playing three blind mice on your guitar. And then later on, you realise that three blind mice didn't sound very much like three blind mice, did it? So your confidence goes. But actually what you're doing is you're getting better all the time. It's just that your viewpoint changes. Yeah. Me too, Harry. I just bought myself a bazooki and. Um, oh. Are you going to perfect Zorba the Greek now? Uh, no, Irish style bazooki. Oh, Irish style. OK, OK, OK. So I think big mandolin. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the reason I've got this slide up here is to say this is what's going to happen to you. We'll be doing stuff, you'll think you're getting better, and then I'll throw in more stuff and you'll go, oh, for goodness sake, but you are getting better all the time. Please remember that. Please remember that I could have created this wonderfully, but I choose to do it this way. 
is there a point in where you know I, I don't know if it's it's maybe just a thing that I I have or but in the in the terms of this diagram is there a point where you know you hit like a kind of plateau in a wall where there is not not that you've you've peaked and become the best at your ability but where there is no progression I think that's really down to the person yeah um I mean, there may be some things where you can't get any better, but you have to define your terms. So yeah. if you're if you're learning arithmetic, you can't get any better at adding two numbers together. Once you know how to do it, you're done. Yeah. But if it's something that's less tightly defined, then no, I think you can always get better. I think there's always ways of doing something differently, doing it, approaching it in a different way. You're an instrumentalist, you'll know that. You'll know that yeah. you, you'll see, you'll hear someone and they'll do something that suddenly think, oh, well, maybe that gives me an approach that I could use differently. So, no, I think you can, I think you can always get better. All right. Particularly in something like this. Yeah. Because if I'd had that when I first started, I wouldn't have known what I was doing. But now I feel as if I deserve that guitar. So what kind of skills do you need? What kind of skills are we going to try and develop in this module? There's quite a few of them. And the first one in that list is usually the one where most of you guys go, because ah, let's not beat around the bush. For a lot of people, we get into computing because we like talking to the computer, but we're not so keen on talking to other people. But one of the things that you're going to have to do as a business systems analyst is talk to other people and write to other people in all places. So you have to be able to talk to the managing director and the data input person. And you're going to have to be able to relate to both of them. And you're going to have to write all that up. And you're going to have to negotiate because the MD doesn't want to pay so much and wants a cheaper solution. You're going to have to explain why that's a good idea. And the data input person is going to get really upset because all of a sudden they're putting data in, in a different way than they did before. And they've done this for 20 years and why do they have to change now? So you get a lot of communication coming up. There's no getting around that. You'll just have to do it. You're also, not surprisingly for a business systems analyst, going to need analytical skills. But as I said before, it isn't just systems analysis, computing analysis, it's in the business side as well. Understanding the business, understanding the organization, and something you may or may not have come across before, something we call change analysis. How do we take a, a business that's in one place and move it to another place. How do we take a business that's well known for creating operating systems and Microsoft Word and move them to a business who have just spent the best part of $100 billion on making games? How does that change come about? You're away, Harry. Oh, yeah, I see it. Right, OK. Recordings will go up on YouTube as soon as I can. See you next time. Going along with the communication skills will be presentation skills. 
you're going to have to talk to people. You're going to have to present your ideas. You're going to have to persuade people that your ideas are right. Hello, Mr. Managing Director. I would like to spend £200,000 of your business's money putting in some new systems. Why? Oh, I don't know. I just please give me the money. Ah. Not really going to work. So you're going to have to work in your presentation skills. Similarly, you're going to have to work in your analytic technical skills to try to understand what's out there. To understand what systems are available to put in, what similar systems are there, or oh, they want this and I know about this system and that could do the same job. So you have to keep up with everything that's going on. Understand the solutions that are out there already and be able to implement them. And this is a business. They're there to make money. So there's no getting around it. You have to understand about finance as well. You have to understand how businesses see their financial situation. So balance sheet, profit and loss, financial projections, all that kind of stuff. You need to start understanding them as well. There's one other skill that I always throw in. And you won't find it in any of the books and we're not going to cover it again, but I found it to be one of the most important things that I've come across. It's learning to say no. Because there'll be lots of things that people want to do. And you can't do it either because it's not technically feasible or because it doesn't fit in the budget or because there's a competing um, priority elsewhere. And you'll just have to say, uh, well, I would love to, but, but it all comes down to no in the end. So taking that all into account, that's where this module tries to come in. We're going to look at the analysis of a system. We're going to create business documents. So it's documents that are suitable for both the business and the technical side. So you'll create documents that the business owner can understand, but also create documents that are suitable for our tech people to take away and use to implement the systems. Key to that is understanding the business process. Who does what, where, when, and how does that happen? And those are the questions you should be continually asking yourself. And that's going to be the approach that we take to the assessment. Anybody get any questions about that just now? I noticed why is missing. <laughs> Who, what, where, when, and how, but no why. <laughs> I was wondering why. <laughs> um, you sure that's going on? I think your eyes are getting faulty, James. I, there it's there, look. It's been there all the time. There's a video to prove it. Why is a big one? And you're quite right to, to point out that I'd missed it out. Why do we do some things? Do we still have to? Can we do them better? Quite right. Any other questions? OK. If no one has any questions just now, uh, we've been here just, well, just over an hour now, so I definitely think that's time to take a break. Say absolutely nothing if you disagree. All right, you all disagree, we'll just keep going then. Excellent. 
OK, we'll take a 10 minute break, OK? See you back here in 10.
OK, and we're back. Everyone got a chance to grab a cup of tea? Cheers. OK, end of thought of anything um, you wanted to ask during that break? Trying to figure out where that. I've closed the curtains and there must be a hole. There was a bit of the sun just hitting my face there. Very annoying. <laughs> OK, if there's no questions, what I'll do, so I've got a couple of things I want to do. I want to take you through what's on Moodle and what's on Teams, and I also want to take you through the assessment regime. So what I'll do first of all is show you Teams, because there's already some stuff on Teams and there will be more coming up. If you haven't yet explored Teams, oops, there's a general channel where we can chat. And at the top of that, <coughs> Are some tabs. So for example, if you can't even be bothered finding Moodle, there's a tab that just puts it on there. I don't think I've logged in, but it is there. I haven't, but never mind. There's a link to that student information document. I did send you a link to this in your welcome email. So it's a whole load of FAQs for want of a better phrase. So all your assessment thing, how pass marks are done, module information, resources that you can use, tools that might be helpful, information on referencing, all that kind of stuff. Another tab is the YouTube channel. So the plan is that each of these meetings is recorded and I will upload them to the YouTube channel. You'll see that there's one already there. That's last year's. So as well as uploading this year's, I'll also upload last year's. Just in case I've explained it in a different way or it's more helpful and it's you know, if you've already listened into this one live, why not listen to last year's not live? And you might just see it from a different point of view. And the final one is the syllabus there. So that tells you exactly what we'll be doing every week. So this is the 21st. So you can see we're doing the introduction and that goes through for each of the weeks there. As well as the introduction, there are tasks. In other words, things that you'll be doing as we are covering them in the, in the class. And this is a way, so, so normally what would happen if we're sitting in the university is if I'm doing stuff on UML diagrams. Then I'll show you it. And then at the lab, I can wander about, look over your shoulder and make sure that you're doing UML diagrams and that you're OK with them. But of course, I can't do that here. I don't know what you're up to. So what I'm going to do instead is ask you to upload the ones that you've created. So on Teams, you will start to see assignments come through. And when those assignments come through, it's your cue to upload these things. And it's just me making sure that you're keeping up and not just 
um, struggling and hiding in a corner or whatever. You'll also see things on there called staff interview, and I'll we'll talk about those um, when I'm talking about the assessments. The dates of the assessments are all there, and I'll go through those individually. OK, so everything is there right at the start. OK, and that includes all the material. So if you go on to Moodle right now, not on that one, but on ours. I'm just going to change so I'll get extra stuff on here, you know, answers and stuff that I'm not going to show you, not surprisingly. So this is how it should look to you. I know that some of you are keen on using phones or tablets or whatever. I would also encourage you to look at the Moodle site on a computer with a decent sized screen. And also, if you haven't already, expand this thing up here, expand the left hand column, because what that does is it takes you through everything that we are doing in order. So it tells you about the course, it tells you about the assessments, it tells you about the labs and tutorials, and then we start with the introduction. And all the information is there. So there's the there's a presentation that we had just now. There's a presentation that we'll be having next. And you'll see in each of these sections. Um, there are different headings, so there is a core material. You absolutely positively must do this stuff. There is supporting material, stuff that you will need to get a decent mark. So I won't be doing this. So most of the core material I'll be doing in the lecture. The supporting material you'll be doing on your own. And then there's additional material, which is. It's not examinable. You can get an A without looking at the additional material, but I think you'll find it helpful. So if you have time, have a look at it. I think you'll find it useful. Another thing just in the introduction is the course texts. There are three here. Not surprisingly, business analysis. Business analysis techniques. And something called soft systems methodology. The idea with soft systems is it's how we um, integrate people into a computing process. Now, these are the course texts, but I'm not making you buy them. Anybody who had my operating systems module will remember I made you buy the book. I'm not making you buy any of these. What I'm saying is they're really helpful and they're in the library. So I'm not quite sure how it's working just now getting into the library. Um, but I think it's open. I'm almost certain it's open. So that oh, for goodness sake. So there are copies of these in the library, so you can view them in there. Some of them there are also electronic versions. If you do want them, you won't be disadvantaged by buying a used copy. So there's a, a nine pound used copy on Amazon. Going to the library and doing them is absolutely fine. If you do look at them, you'll see that some of the stuff that we're doing is actually based very much on these. So some of the techniques that we'll be looking at later comes from this. But you'll be relieved to know that we're not doing 99 of them. So I've just chosen a few. I'm not entirely sure that the phrase 99 essential tools works as a phrase. If you need 99 things, I'm not sure they're all essential, but that's just me. 
OK, so there are that's the course text. That's what a lot of stuff comes from. So it's based on. There are other texts that you may find helpful. Dealing with difficult people, for example, for dealing with me. Um, these are again. Things that you might find useful. And part of the reason I put them up here is not only might you find them useful, they are all free. So it's a, a site called Book Boon. So if you just go there and click on them, it will take you to Book Boon. Oh, not that one, apparently. It's helpful. So I'll take it to Book Boon. You can create a you can create an account and you can get access to a lot of these books for free. Presumably that one is no longer free, such as life. If you find ones that aren't available anymore, let me know and I'll take them off again. OK. So as we go through our course, all the stuff on the left is exactly the order we're going through it in. So if I take you back to the Syllabus. This is week one. We're doing introduction. Next up is ladder of inference. So not surprisingly, the next thing in the middle is a ladder of inference. OK, so we're just going through these things in the order, which is great because I'm asking you to look at them before we get to them. So it's really helpful for you to go through these materials before we get there. I'm afraid there's no referral code famous. No, nope. if there was, I'd be charging you for it, not for free. Have a look at the stuff in advance and um, read it before we get into the lecture. Try and understand it and that gives you an opportunity to ask questions, understanding what it is we're doing. OK, so we'll just go through these in order following the syllabus. Now, I will not give you absolutely 100 percent that we might not move things about just a wee bit. If we get through some things more slowly, then things might be delayed or whatever, but they will be very similar to this if it's not exact. OK, so all of this stuff is there. Sorry. Uh, is the presentation happening in um, April or February? That would be February. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'll update that. OK, Cheers. yes. I've, I've, for some reason, I put 18th of February here and then right now it's 18th of April. I must have been late that night. Um, yeah, 18th of April, 18th of, oh God, I just did it again, 18th of February. So I have our dates against it there. OK, so a one to one link between the materials and how the, we will do them, apart from one thing, which is down here, there's um, an appendix. Some of you know did it object oriented analysis in second year. Some of you didn't. Uh, but it covered a lot of things like UML. And that kind of stuff, which you will find helpful for the stuff that we're doing here. So I'm not going to go over it again. But Michael kindly let me copy his materials in here for those of you who didn't do object oriented analysis. So some of you did it in second year and are talking about things and there's others in your group that don't know what we're talking about. It's here for you. The other thing in each uh, section that I'd quite like you to do is the section feedback. It's anonymous. It's one question and it's just basically. How was it? Did you get it? So that I know whether or not to move on or maybe to to. To cover some things again, OK, it's all anonymous. I don't know who said what, but if you fill that out, it just gives me an idea. OK, 
OK, so all the information's there, including links to the meetings. Remember that we have a lab, we have a lecture, which is what we're in, and then we have a tutorial. The lab and all the lab materials are also here. So what we're doing in the labs is practicing creating the charts and diagrams that you will be putting into your final report. Now, the lab is based on something called Lucid Chart. It's online, it's free, but do me a favour when you, if you're using this, and I don't see why you wouldn't, when you sign up, use your UWS email account, because if you sign up for an education account, you get a lot more features, including, importantly, the ability to collaborate. And if you hadn't picked up on it yet, we're going to be doing this work in groups. So it means you can collaborate with your group online. So the, the lab is self-guided, which is to say all of the materials are here. Text and video tutorials. So you'll be going through the lab in your own time because you'll need more than the hour a week, believe me in order to create these diagrams and then to practice them, there's a different case study. So again, we mentioned earlier uh, that their assessment is based on a case study. I've made a smaller case study for the lab so that you can have a look at that and start creating diagrams for that smaller case study that will help you create diagrams for the assessed case study. And part of the reason I've done that is because when we get to the assessment, um, I can't... I can't um, help you with the assessment. So I, I can't say, oh no, you should do this or you should do that because it's the assessment. But I certainly can help you with the lab. So if you create all these documents for the lab case study, it gives you a head start in the assessment case study. And it's also, as I say, one that I can help you with. If that makes sense. So the lab case study. I really need a new computer. I'm going to start a GoFundMe for a new computer. I'm trying to start Word in the background if you're wondering. And if I do start a GoFundMe for a new computer, don't be surprised if I then spend the money on guitars instead. OK, so there's the lab case study. It's the same idea. It's a, for goodness sake, so pretend business, in this case, a uh, car trading business. They are changing how they do things. And as part of that, you have to create diagrams. So here's the requirements that they've done. Some of you who did object oriented may remember this coming back to them. Luke, Logan. There's the data flow diagrams. There are data store diagrams or logical data structures. So there's examples both of the business and the types of diagram that you need to create for this business. So you can work through this as part of your lab. 
and then that will give you an insight into how you do the assessment. That seems like an opportune time, unless anyone has any questions, to actually start talking about the assessment. Yeah, all musicians are broke. Just one more guitar. Guitar acquisition syndrome is definitely a thing. OK, so we think back to what I was talking about in the introduction. <sighs> yes, thank you. I can hear the front door. I don't need you to tell me. Um, think back to what we were talking about in the introduction. So this is about being in a business this is about you trying to understand the business and trying to both document the current state of the business and also thinking about what changes could be made. So what I'm trying to do with this assess assessment is mimic what you would do in real life. Now, of course, it won't be exactly the same. It's a much smaller system. Um, we can't do everything you do in real life. We're not even sitting in the same room, for example. But we'll try and do it as much like real life as possible. That's why it's based on a case study. And if you haven't yet found the case study, not surprisingly, it is on middle. So the case study is in there. And you really, really need to read that carefully and understand it. But if you haven't yet looked at it, it's about a hotel business. Also, because we're trying to emulate real life, um, we've got some different types of assessment. So let's think about what would happen in real life. So you're the business systems analyst, you're working for your company and you've been brought in as consultants. So what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to work with your team to uh, understand the business and create information for that business. And the first piece of information that you're going to have to create is a presentation to actually get them to hire you in the first place. And then once they have hired you, you have to produce the full documentation for the business. And again, that's what we're trying to emulate. So we'll emulate you guys working together. But we're not emulating it, you're doing it. But part of the assessment is showing me that you're doing it. The first part of the group assessment is to pitch for the job. So you'll be doing a presentation. And because you're pitching, I won't even be judging it. Well, actually, I will, but I'll only get one vote. So your presentation will be to everybody in the class. And everybody in the class gets to vote on how you did. They'll get to mark you. So it'll be a peer assessment. Whether you win that or not, we're going to pretend that you do. And then finally, you're going to create a report for the business. So there are different elements to it. When you work together, you're going to create minutes and submit them. You're going to do a presentation as a group and you're going to do a final report as a group. I'll come back to this in a second. So we're in this class for about 12 weeks or so. It'll take us a week or two to get it sorted into our groups, which leaves 10 weeks. So every fortnight, every two weeks, you're going to have a meeting. Now, you're going to have a meeting because you need to submit the minutes once every two weeks. That is not to say that you should only have a meeting every two weeks. At the minimum, I would expect you guys to be meeting every week. You're together, That's you've got time in the lab, you've got time in the tutorial. You'll have meetings, you'll take minutes, 
and you'll upload those minutes. And it's a very simple marking scheme. If you don't do it, you don't get any marks. If you do a very simple set of minutes, you'll get one mark. But if you do a more a complete set of minutes, you'll get two marks. And you've got a couple of ways of looking at this. You can say, man, I can't believe he's making us do minutes for a meeting. Or you can say, what, 10 marks just for creating minutes for a meeting? Yeah, beauty. That's a quarter of the way to passing the module. It's up to you how you want to approach it. OK, so that's part of the assessment. Minutes every fortnight. Minutes, 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 minutes. OK. And of course, you'll also see them on Moodle. Assessment, submission, group minutes. And just like there is with the. With everything else, it's all there from the start, so one, two, three, four and five, all there ready to go. You have a one week window. So the minutes will open. At 11 a.m. one week and close 11 a.m. the next week. I'll come to the size of the group. Look. Um, So there's no extensions. If you miss them, that's when you don't get any. And your first set of minutes is due in on the 4th of February, so two weeks from now. So basically it gives us a week to get into our groups and then it gives you a week to have your meeting and submit them. You'll notice that all of these things are on Moodle. OK, that's why there's this big red animated arrow to remind you to look at this stuff. And that's also why I'm saying look at it on a computer occasionally, because on a phone or on a tablet. These things are a bit more hidden. But you can see, for example, you've got three things to do for next week. There's a, a quick quiz. I'll tell you about this in a second when we talk about the assessment. And you're going to select your group. And your first set of minutes is due in on the 4th of February. And actually, if you click on these, it will even take you to the place where you submit. Now, as it says there, only one member of the group should upload. If more than one member of the group uploads, I'm just going to take whoever's top of my list. OK, I'm just going to be as simple as that. Whoever's first one that I see on the list, that's the one I will mark. That said, you should swap these things around. So it shouldn't be the same person taking the minutes every week. You sh everybody should get a go. So everybody should get a go at taking the minutes. Everybody should get a go at cheering the meeting, all that kind of stuff. So swap it around. But I'll leave it up to your group to decide how to do that. OK, so that's a that's the first part of the minutes. The first part of the assessment is the minutes. Anybody get any questions about that before we move on? Thanks for the vote of confidence, Look, That's good. Nope, everyone happy with that just now? OK, so next bit in your, this is what you would do in real life, is when you're going to pitch for the job. So after you've been in your group for about five or six weeks, it's on the syllabus, can't remember exactly, and I'll probably call it April anyway, so go and look at it. After you've been in the group, you're going to make a presentation to the board of the company. And the presentation will be marked. It will be marked on the content of the presentation. How well you present it. And how persuasive you've been. In other words, would you hire them? Would you hire you? OK, so that's 15 out of the 20 marks. And those are group based. OK, so the first three are for your group. But as a final five marks, because what I tended to find was that. How can I put this charitably? 
some people were less involved than others. So there's also an individual contribution. And that's the final five marks. And again, that's also peer assessed. So what will happen is we'll go into the tutorial time. You will make the presentation. You will then be asked questions. Because you will always be asked questions. And then everyone in the group will mark. Everyone in the class will mark your group and the individual. So it's probably a good idea to tell people who you are just in case they don't know. Once again, that is already on Moodle. Come on, you can do it. There we go. Now, I've made one change this year. Um, normally, what we would do is do this actually in class. And you'd get up and you come to the front of the class and you do the presentation. We can't. Clearly, we can't. So, I want you to do it virtually. In other words, I want you to make a video. How you do that is up to you, and there's some links to some tools on the student information document that might help with that. But you might, for example, decide to have a Teams meeting together and record it, or you might decide to make a PowerPoint and record over that, or you might decide to use any one of the dozen tools that are on the net that allow you to create something like this. I'll leave it up to you. Surprise me and surprise your classmates with how you've chosen to approach it. Because remember, what you're trying to do is sell yourself here. It's about understanding the business and then selling that to the company so that they'll hire you. So you will create this video, you'll upload it, uh, and then we will watch them together. So I will do it same way as I do with everything on here. I'll play them so that everyone can see them. And then you'll um, assess the submission. I've put a link to a course. There's a one hour course from Google if you're not keen on public speaking. That's a helpful course to do. I think they even give you a wee certificate at the end which won't do you any harm either. Now, there's one wee wrinkle to this. Because it's a peer assessment, um, and again, all of you, I think, was there anybody not in my professional computing practice class? Make yourself known now. OK, so it's the same peer assessment tool. So to do the peer assessment, what I need you to do is click on this thing. And you're not uploading a report. Your work submission is just enter yes into the box. It doesn't even have to be yes. It could be no. It could be Tony sucks. It could be anything you want. You just need to put something into the submission to show that you're taking part. OK, and that allows us to do a peer assessment. OK, so go there, put in some text just to be part of this. And you'll see that that's the submission and then the assessment deadline is Friday the 18th. So that's when we're actually going to do these presentations. So it's not far away. And I said I would go back and explain it. That's what this thing is. The peer assessment. OK, so let's just go there, type some text into the box and then we can move on. Don't forget. Anybody get any questions about that before we go on? OK, in that case, let's move on to the next bit, the final report. 
is a group report. And you can see that's worth half the marks for the module. So you're going to create a description of the business based on your understanding of the business. So the case study, any other documents that you look for, but also based on your questioning of the staff. So you'll see on here those tasks. What you'll do once you look at the case study and start to understand who is who the staff members are, you will be able to request that the staff member turns up. No, it's me, of course. But I'm going to pretend to be these other people. You will then be able to interview the staff and ask them questions about how the business works. How it's been working, what they think should happen, any issues. OK, and you can then use that. To help create your report. Now I've put a couple of these in just now. These are some of the things that might move around. So we'll see how we get on in terms of how many of these you need. Sometimes people are really keen to have lots and lots of interviews. Sometimes it sort of peters out after a couple of them. Um, so this is one of the ones that's fairly fluid. So another one of the things that you'll see there is a staff request. And that's just one where you go and I have made a list of all the staff and you can choose which ones you want to interview. So there'll be two on that day. And it's just a simple majority vote. If you don't vote, it's, it's someone else's choice. You go here and you choose two people that you want to interview and save it. OK, so once you get a bit more into your case study, once you read a bit more about who they are and what they do, you might decide who you want to interview. The hotel owner, their children, the accountant, the receptionist, the people that look after the hotel rooms. It's entirely up to you. Once you've done all that, once you've got all the information together, that allows you to create a final report. And you'll see that it's 50 marks and it's 10 marks for each of these. So you will have to create use case diagrams. You'll have to create BPMN diagrams, class diagrams. You'll have to do a financial report. If you don't know what these things are, that's fine because we'll be covering it. We'll be covering business activity modeling and UML and BPMN and financial analysis. OK, so we will get to those. So it's the diagrams and they are surrounding text. So the explanation of why they are important. The final bit is the professionalism of the report. Again, this is about real life. And if someone is hiring you as a consultant and paying you money, what you submit should be of a high standard. No excuses, no dog ate, ate my homework, no, oh, I was bringing in five different people's information and I couldn't be bothered to reformat it. This is professional work for professional people. And you see on there that normally I actually ask for this on paper for exactly that reason. I know that people think we're electronic all the time, but actually the number of businesses that still insist on using paper is quite high. So normally what I do for this is I make each team create not just an online version, but a paper version. Oddly enough, the paper version helps because you see things you might not see on the screen. You notice mistakes that aren't obvious on the screen. You know, you read through it and you suddenly go, well, hang on, what? Just because you're doing it in a different way. However, I'm not going to ask for the paper version this time because, you know, you can't wander up to my office and drop it in. But 
I would still urge you to look at it in different ways. Look at it on a screen. If you have facilities, print it off and have a look at it printed off. Look at it on a tablet. Any any way you can do to look at it differently. Read it out. Use Microsoft Immersive Reader to have it be read to you to see if it makes sense. Anything to try and get uh, a, a sense of it. Not what you think you've written, because that's a blind spot we all have. You know, we write something, we think we've done something, but actually we do something different. But what you've actually read, and as Luke says in the comments, immersive reader is really good for that. If you're going to brush your teeth, set it going to read your report to you and listen to your report as if it's someone else's. And you soon start picking up on things that maybe you're not as happy with. Anybody got any questions about that? No. Nope. OK, so anybody who's been paying attention will have noticed 10 marks for minutes, 20 marks for a presentation, 50 marks for the report is only 80. So we've got one last thing. I should have my Colombo cigar in. One last thing. It's an individual report. OK. Part of the reason for this is I don't want people riding on the coattails of others in their group. I want groups that work together and help each other. By putting this in, it means I catch all the people who think, oh, well, I can just sit back and not do anything and I'll just get marks for the group. Well, if you don't do your individual report and you don't pass it, you won't. So you have to create, and I'm not looking for pages and pages and pages. I'm not looking for hundreds of pages here. It's a reflective report. Things that were good, things that were bad, things that you do again, things that you'd avoid. Those are examples of the things you put in. Feel free to add more. So 10 marks for your report. I'll mark that. But 10 marks from your peers in your group. Did the people in your group think that you worked well or not? So you'll be able to mark the other people in your group. And again, it's all anonymous. They won't know. Well, they'll probably know if they end up with two. If they average out at two, then nobody liked them. But it's all anonymous and it gives you the chance to mark your class members. Anybody get any questions about that? Um, sorry, Tony, I've just got a question. Mm -hmm. um, it says on Moodle uh, self-selected group, cho group choice. Um, yep. Do we get a choice to sort of form our own groups or is it all just randomly selected? I'm just about to come to that. OK. Anything on the assessments themselves just now? OK, so hopefully that makes this slightly less confusing now. So that's just basically everything that's in there. Tells you what it is, who's going to mark it, whether it's me, whether it's your group, whether it's your peers, and the mark sheet you get for each of them. So hopefully that makes more sense now. And I know it looks complicated. Possibly it is, but on the other hand, it is trying to replicate what we do. We work together. We look for work and we present that to our clients. We then create the work for those clients. And then after that, we reflect within our group about what we did well, what we did badly for our next piece of work that we're going to go for. So I'm trying to replicate that. OK, everyone happy with that then? OK. Now, one of the things that you'll see on the introduction is a whole, whoops, not that one, is a whole 
slideshow on group working because I'm aware it's not everyone's favourite thing. So I'm not going to go through this in detail. But there are good reasons for working in groups. If nothing else, that's what you do in real life. It's, it's unusual that you're a one man band. Instead, you're working with other people. And one of the things that we want to do in this course is emulate that, give you practice in that when the stakes are lower than, I don't know, being fired from your job. So we'll try and emulate, emulate that here. So we're going to have groups of four. Now, the numbers in the class don't, um, uh, don't divide by four. So there'll probably be one or two groups of five. I haven't looked to see exactly the numbers yet. Normally what I would do is allocate random groups. And for those of you that hate groups, you hate random groups even more. I'll tell you why I would normally do it. When you're working with people, part of the thing you have to do is discuss what's going on, discuss possible approaches, discuss what's good and what's bad. If you're working with someone that you know and you know well, a couple of things happen. One is because you know them, you tend to have a better view of what they're like. In other words, if one of your friends says something, you give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, OK, that's fine. Fred said it, it's probably OK. Even though Fred might not know what Fred's talking about. Even though Wilma might have just come out with the worst rubbish in the world, because they're like your friend, you kind of go, yeah, OK. Related to that is the idea that we tend not to challenge in other things. So we have a, an inflated view of our friend's knowledge and we are unwilling to challenge them in general because we don't have friends, we don't want to upset them. So rather than say, no, we should do this because this will make it better, we go, yeah, OK, because you don't want to cause a fuss. There's also this whole trying to emulate what happens in real life thing. Because unless it's your company, good luck getting to choose who you work with. So normally what I would do is set up random groups. And those groups would do the assessments that we've just spoken about, the presentation and the final report. And this is the bit that I'm going to skip over because normally I would go through the pros and cons of group work, why you work in groups, good reasons, reasons why you wouldn't. And that's probably the big one there is because you always, always get people who think they can just run on the back of everyone else. But the bottom line and the reason we have this in here is that we do groups because employers want people that can work together. That's it. If you can say to people, yeah, we did this in a group, this is our group work and we did this together. Employers go, fantastic. I'm not going to hire somebody who's going to sit in the corner and not talk to people. Or if I do put them with people, I'm hiring someone that can get on and get on, get the job done. So that's why we do it. This is very much employer led. This is what employers are telling us they want you guys to do. So we're doing it in a group. But I am not daft. I know that things don't always work out. That sometimes you get people who don't pull the weight. In fact, sometimes you get people who don't even respond when you talk to them. So again, in the trying to emulate real life vein, I'm giving you a choice with your groups. Now, before I get to that choice, I'll tell you how your groups are going to be set up. 
normally what I would do is go into Moodle and there's a function there that just divides the class. I press the button and I say I want groups of four and it goes away and creates groups of four randomly. Because of the circumstances we're in, I realize it's harder for people. And so I am giving the option. You can choose this or not. It's entirely up to you. But I have given you the option if you'd prefer. Of having a self selected group. OK, so that's this one here. And again, it's got a date of next week. So by hook or by crook, by next week we will have groups. If you want. Oh. Some people have already joined a group. If you want, you can come here. And speak to your colleagues. And say I want to be in a group with you and you'll come here and you'll choose the same group. So at the moment we have. David Mohammed. I'm not entirely sure. I apologize. I'm never entirely sure how to say that. All haven't chosen the same group. I don't know if they meant to do that. I don't know if they're friends or whether they just accidentally all chose group one. But if you want to choose your own group, if you want to self select your groups, feel free to do so. So anyone who has self selected a group, that's fine. And I'm doing this just because. We can't get together. Normally we'd get together in the lab and the tutorials. All right, thanks, James. Or wherever we happen to be. And again, I can come round and look over your shoulder and see whether the teams are getting together and working or whether they're just sort of staring at each other. And I can do stuff to try and help them work together. When we're doing it remotely, I can't do that. So I'm letting you um, choose your own group. So do that by next week. If you have not chosen your group by then, the remainder I'll just randomly assign to a group. So it's entirely up to you. Choose your own group or I'll assign you to a random group. Fair enough. Everyone understand how that's going to work? OK, so just go here. I'll choose the same group and that will just put you all into the same group. However, as I was saying, Normally when it's random groups, I know that things don't work, so I emulate real life. I'll let you fire people. So. In week five, so before we do the presentation. So you get about two or three weeks after you form the groups. You get the chance to say no, it's not working. They are not responding to emails. They're not attending group meetings. They're not submitting the. The information that I was looking for. So the group can get together and go it's not working. Wilma really has to go. Now it has to be unanimous, so the rest of the group have to say. No, it's not working. They're not doing it and you have to show me evidence of that not working. So I would suggest doing it on Moodle. Because one of the things that we will have on Moodle. Is. Motion detected at the front door. Once you have. Created your groups, there will be a discussion forum. OK, and it's split by group. Now I know that the temptation will be to go into Messenger or WhatsApp or whatever the latest one is that old people like me don't know about. If you do that, I don't know what's going on. So if you come back to me and say, oh, we keep messaging him and he's not coming, he's not getting back to us. Well, I'm not in your Facebook. I'm not in your WhatsApp or whatever you're using, but I can look at the group discussion forum. So use the group discussion forum and that's where that's part of the, the thing I will use to see whether or not you know, if someone said, right, our first group meeting is 10.30 Friday. Where have you been, Barney? Why didn't you turn up? I can see that and I can see that happening. 
and it gives me a sense of what's going on. If you all just turn up and go, ah, no, they're rubbish, and I've got no evidence, I'm not going to support the firing. So make sure you use something that I can see. It must be unanimous from the rest of the group. It can't be for personal reasons. Oh, I don't like them. Oh, suck it up, get on with it. Again, real life, you work with people that you don't like. As long as they're doing the job, do the job. And in a similar vein, you can only fire somebody because they won't do something, not because they can't. So if you've asked someone to do someone something and they've submitted it and it's not been very good and they've said why it's not very good and can they get any help? Well, no, they're doing their best, they're trying. So maybe think about who's in the group and maybe that's not the best thing for them to do and maybe redistribute responsibilities or whatever. So it's not because they can't do something, you can only fire them because they won't do something. Okay so far? For those of you chatting, the link is on Moodle. I already showed you, so right at the top of Moodle. Self-selected group choice, click on it, go there. And then make sure you know which it is. OK, everyone OK with that so far? There are consequences if you fire people. You don't get to replace the person. So instead of having five people or four people in your group, you now only have three people in your group. But you still have to do the same stuff. OK, you also can't use any of the work that they have submitted. Presumably it's not very good. And that's why you wanted to file them anyway. Or it doesn't exist and that's why you wanted to file them anyway. Anybody who's been fired will be placed into a new group for all the fired people. If that's a smaller group, then I'll tell you now, that's your problem. If you can't engage with the group that you're in, if you end up in a group and it's on your own, that's the consequence of you not engaging. So engage, talk to your group members. Because you'll have to do exactly the same thing. You're still going to have to do the presentation and the report and everything else. So all the people that are fired, all the people who decide they're not going to engage, will all get put into a group on their own. And they can ignore each other. OK, so if you want to do that, you need to let me know. Tell me the reasons. We'll then have a, a meeting with me and the whole group. And I'll tell you whether or not you can fire people. So again, it's if they're not engaging, if they won't produce stuff, not if they're struggling and they can't. OK. Anybody get any questions about that? All happy? All right, so I think I think that's everything I wanted to cover today. So you know where your information is. It's all on Moodle. But I've also put things on Teams. I will update that. You know when your submissions are due in. Presentation 18th of February, Logan, stop confusing me. Group report on the 22nd of April. So that's after the two week Easter holiday. That'll be due in. Your individual report is also due in on that date and you will peer assess your group for the week after that. OK. It's imperative that you read the case study, that you understand it. And if you don't understand it, it's imperative that you ask questions. That's part of this. I've said it there. Different employees with different responsibilities and different views of the business 
may give different answers to the same questions. It doesn't mean they're not lying, it's just they might have different priorities, they might have different workloads, so they might see things in a different way. So you might get vastly different answers to the same question, and part of your job as the analyst is to try and figure out these inconsistencies, reconcile them. If you can't reconcile them, you have to make all of them in your documents to say, this lot need to do this, that lot need to do that, they can't go together. Here's my recommendation, but in the end, this is a business decision. That applies to the description of the business itself. It came from the business and they don't really know what you need, so they've, they've created something. So it might be incomplete. It might be inconsistent. It might contain assumptions that they have made about the business that are just wrong. So one of the things you should be doing is questioning the case study itself. Is this true? Can you tell me more about? Is there information on? That has to be requested. Um, and again, one of the things I would normally do on Moodle is have hotel staff questions and answers. Because we're doing it online, I'm tempted this time to put it onto Teams because I think we're all in there all the time anyway. And I'm open to suggestions about whether that's a good idea or not. I know that I tend to see Teams all the time because I have to open it up every day. So I'll see a question that you guys put in. Whereas I might not go into Moodle every day and, and check that. And that's part of what I'm thinking. Anybody get any thoughts about that? Any suggestions? OK, in that case, what I'll do is I'll make a channel. I'll make a new channel on a uh, Teams. I'll call it case study discussion. So any questions you have, put them in there and I will reply um, in the guise of that employee. So if you ask a question to the accountant, I will reply as the accountant. If you ask a question of the receptionist, I'll reply as the receptionist. And the good thing about it being on there is that everybody gets the same information. OK. Yeah, sometimes middle discussions can be, be a wee bit clunky, I think. So yeah, we'll, we'll give teams a go. Look, see how we go. And the discussion itself is much the same as the discussion in the, the chat here. So yeah, should be OK. I think that's it. So you've got an idea of what the um, you get an idea of what the module's about. You get an idea of how it's going to be assessed, and you've got an idea of where all the information is. Sean's saying, if one team asks a question. Do you have to ask it again or can we just use the same answer? No, you can just use the same answer. And that's part of the reason for putting it there. It means that you're all working off the same information rather than rather than um, rather than me um, forgetting what I've said elsewhere and replying differently. Sometimes I'll do that. Just so that you know, sometimes I'll do that deliberately. If you ask a question of a different person, I will deliberately give a different answer. So the receptionist sees the check in process differently to the hotel manager because they're the ones on the, the desk. So I'll deliberately give you different answers for that. But what I don't want to do is give different answers in the same guise. So yes, if someone's asked a question of the person, 
and there's an answer there, you can all use that and you can assume that that's the same thing. And it means everybody's got the same information. Any other questions just now? No? Oh, so yes. So the final one is just labs, lectures, tutorials. So now that I've explained what the lab's about, we have a meeting at 10 a.m. and that's the lab. I will be here to help if you need help, but there's not a, a presentation as such. So all the stuff is in the lab, as I said earlier, and that's for you to work through on your own. But I'm here to help if you can't work it. We'll then have the meeting, the lecture, where we'll talk about different stuff, these things here. And then we'll have the tutorial and the tutorial can have different guises. It might be something that I've put into the slide that you have to work on. It might be staff interviews you have to do. So um, the thing that I showed you earlier where you can choose who turns up and ask questions. So we'll have different things in the tutorial and they will change depending on what goes on. You'll also see things popping up for the assignments that's just your submission for those and like I said before that's me just checking that you're actually doing something and not hiding in a corner. I think that's it. I think that's everything I wanted to say. Does anyone have any questions? No. Okay, in that case, let me stop the recording.